I am super excited about today's message. Last week, we dove into that first question that you asked, how do I deal with stress? That was what we talked about in week one of this You Asked For It series. And today, I'm really excited to talk about the number two thing. Last week was number one. I'm excited to talk about the number two thing that you guys wanted to know the most about. And this is something like you ask it in a lot of different ways. And so the only words I could put to it was spiritual warfare. You guys wanted to know more about spiritual warfare. You were like, Brandon, in some way you were asking, can you tell me about this? What about this? Can, Can you explain this? And so the way that was able to sum it up has really come down to spiritual warfare and being able to talk about it and I'm really excited about this um, in, in a lot of different ways because, like, this series, the You Ask For It series, I wish I was smart enough to have come up with this, but I'm not. Um, like, I, I stole this series idea from other pastors around the country, and, and I think it's a great series, a great opportunity to hear from you guys. But I don't know in all of them that I've ever heard, really, a lot of people ask about spiritual warfare. Like, I hear all the time, we've, we've heard numerous times where people have asked about stress and, and well, how to be a better parent or, or even to get along with my in-laws, you know, those kind of things, right? And so we've had those kind of questions. But spiritual warfare was definitely something that we were kind of shocked when we saw this, but it still excited us because it let us know that you really want to go deeper with God. Like, you really want to understand it and dive in more with Him on understanding what's going on in the spiritual world. So I want to start establishing some discussion before we really dive into it about the spiritual world, about the spiritual world and, and spiritual warfare. And well, what we need to know about wars, here's where I want to go ahead and start off. What we need to know about wars, wars are made up of battles. They're made up of battles. And battles make up smaller components of the bigger picture. So like you can probably name wars that our country has had throughout the past, and you probably can even name battles inside of those wars. And that's what we're going to talk about for a moment is these battles that are happening because we are in a war. I don't know that you understand that, and I want to help us move to a place to where we believe and buy into it, but it really is true. But I want to give you the definition of a battle. Here's what Webster says about battles. Battles involve combat between two persons between factions, between armies, and they consist of any type of extended contest, struggle, or controversy. So it's any type of extended contest, struggle, or controversy. And here's the thing. You guys are asking about a spiritual war. So the war that you're asking about is very different than even what Webster considers, but the definition still fits because this war that we're talking about is one that we can't see. You see, all the wars, in some way, we could potentially see them. And even those today, those that we've had in the Middle East, it's like, well, I can't see those, Brandon. But you can. You can cut on the TV, right? I can cut on the TV. You can see a news report. You can get an understanding of what's going on. You can see those wars. But this spiritual warfare and truthfulness, we can't cut on the TV and go, oh, now I see how that's actually happening. Like, we see things in the natural, we don't see so much in the supernatural. And so it's hard to cut on a TV, or it's hard to go to the position and go, oh, that's the war that's happening. Oh, that's the battle that's taking place. So it distracts us, it keeps us from being able to see it, and we don't recognize what's actually happening in the spiritual, the war that is going on. So before we dive into anything, for each one of us, we need to believe that there is a spiritual world. Like, we've got to move to this place. Every one of us have to move to this place where we're going. You know what? There is a spiritual world. There really is. We need to acknowledge that in this spiritual wor- wor- world, there is a war that is going on. There is one that we're facing and one that we're dealing with. This is a spiritual world happening and going on all around us all the time. All the time. As Christians, we're in a battle on a daily basis. Some sort daily, we are facing a battle as Christians. And you may even know what I'm talking about, and you may even feel it, but you're not able to put, it to the, put the name to it or recognize that this is a spiritual battle. We just tend to see it in the natural, and we hang out in the natural, thinking that it is a natural battle. In warfare, battles are fought on different fronts for different reasons with varying degrees of intensity. And the same is true for spiritual warfare. 
They happen on different fronts, different places in our life. It may happen in our marriage. It may happen with our kids. It may happen in our finances or our job or a relationship with a family member. They find themselves still happening on different fronts in different places for many different reasons. Like you probably have a reason that a battle is going on in your life, and you probably think it's a pretty good reason. Like, yeah, you know, I'm going to stand behind this one. I'm going to plow along in this one. And so you probably even have different reasons for your battles. And even the intensity of them. Like when we think on wars and we think about these battles, so often there are battles that stand out to us and we don't think so much about the others because of the intensity of those battles. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? Like any of you history buffs in this room, you know what I'm talking about? Like the Gettysburg, like you understand some of these battles that take place. I'm not that great in history and so I'm not going to start trying to name them because all of a sudden you history people are going to go, bro, you have no clue what you're talking about and I'm going to lose you. So I'm going to stick to what I know a little bit of, all right? So we're going to stay in that realm. But even though we can't see the attacker, and these attackers are coming against us, even though we physically cannot see them, it does not make them not real. It does not mean that they are not real. They're very much real. Like, I don't know how to really get us here except for telling you and explaining to you that the ability to fight this battle begins with the willingness to believe. Like, the ability to fight, the ability to, ability to recognize a spiritual warfare going on is that starts with the place that we believe. We believe that there is a God. We believe that there is a spiritual world. That we even believe that there is someone trying to harm us. But we also believe that there is someone who loves us and protect us, protects us and is even trying and fighting for us. If we can first begin with believing that, then we can begin to see how these battles are fought. If we realize that there is a spiritual world, then we can start to realize how these battles are fought and how they really do impact our daily lives in so many different ways. So many different ways. We can come to understand spiritual warfare, what you guys have asked me to talk about. We can come to understand it if we'll move to a place where we believe that there is a spiritual world and that there is a war taking place and we believe that there is one trying to harm us, but there is also one that is trying to protect us, one that is fighting for us. And look, I, I, I know, I get it. I totally get it. The spiritual world seems hard to believe because it isn't something we can't see. Like, I, I get it. And, every, and truthfully, every single week and every single message, including this one, I have this desire, this natural desire, that I want to be able to bring you a message that you're going to be able to fully understand. That like I have proof and I have facts and I have exacts that whenever you look at this message or you hear this message, you know, like you're it's absolute. There's no question to it. It doesn't take a whole lot of belief. You just know it's kind of like putting gas in your car. It's kind of like if you're like, well, I need to go, I I I know I'm running on empty, so I need to put gas in my car. I know that if I go over to the gas station, they're going to have that gas. I can put it in my vehicle, and I am good. Like, I know that. I physically can see it happening because I also physically pay for it, right? So it's a physical experience that you know very well, and you can believe in it. So every week I struggle with bringing a message of some kind that almost is like putting gas in your tank. But I have to be confident and comfortable in knowing the fact that, well, there is a bit of mystery that's left to it. There is a bit of mystery that's left to every single message that's brought. That there is a level of faith that every single one of us have to walk in. That every single one of us have to move to a place to believe. Knowing that, you know what, Brandon, my tank is empty right now. Man, I'm going through so much. I'm facing so many different things. I'm getting attacked by this all the time. And then whenever you hear a message or I talk to you or we're connecting and I'm telling you something along the lines of, listen, I just want you to continue to pray. Hey, don't give up on worship. Continue to worship. Listen, hang in there. Dive into your word. There's a little bit of mystery there to going, is it really going to fill my tank? Can't you tell me A through B or or give me X, Y, Z to do? Or can you tell me how to dot that I or cross that T so I know exactly that this is going to be fixed? So there is a sense of mystery that takes place, and it takes faith. It takes faith. Believing in something hoped for and not yet seen. This is a whole foundation to this life that we have with God. So let me ask you this, and I'm going to get real with you for just a second. And I'm not asking you to raise your hands by any means. not asking you at all. But for most of us, I would say that we've all been here. Like in some way, we've all been here before. And it's kind of taboo in a way to talk about in the Christian world, if we can use that word. But it's, have you ever doubted? Have you ever been in a place going, is this really real? Is, is what I'm in and, and what I'm, I'm believing right now, I mean, 
I'm not seeing him show up. I, I, is it even real? Have you ever doubted? What I want to tell you is in that, that is spiritual warfare in your mind. That is spiritual warfare taking place in your mind right there. It is happening right in that very moment where Satan is trying to convince you and bring in this place of uncertainty of if God is real. Is God real? Is heaven real? It is a spiritual warfare where he is trying to separate us from God. Like I said before, there is a sense of mystery to this. And it's hard for us to understand and wrap our brains around. But truthfully, truthfully, do you want to serve a God that you can wrap your brain around? Do you want to serve a God that you can fully understand? Do you want to serve a God that you can absolutely make fit to your ability of understanding and your capabilities of, of if I'm looking at this, I can fully explain it. If he moves in it, I can see how he did it. I can explain my God. Are you looking for someone that's like that? If that's the God we serve, one that we can fully understand, one that we can wrap our brain around to see how he does things, then that makes him really nothing more than a really good motivational speaker from a long time ago. That's all he really comes down to. But so often we're caught up trying to understand who he is and what he's capable of and what he can do, how he's going to do it, that we're doing it in the mindset of what we see is capable, what we believe is possible, and we miss the fact that he is able to do far more than anything that we can imagine. That's the God that we have. But our spiritual world, we get caught up in, all of a sudden reveals itself in the natural, and we forget about the spiritual, and we're like, God, I don't know how you're going to do it. Do you realize how silly that question is? God, I don't know how you're going to do this. I couldn't. Good luck, brother. No. That's not the God that we want to serve, amen? That's not the God. I want a God whose ability is far beyond anything I can understand, beyond any ability of rationale, anything I can rationally explain. I want a God that, that when it, something happens and he moves, the world goes, how did that happen? And I go, I don't have a clue, but I know it did. I can't give it a diagnosis. I can't explain it. I can't give it a, a, a reason, but I know that my God did it. That's the kind of God I want to serve. I want a God that can do something with absolutely nothing. That's the God I want. I want a God that I serve, one that can have a thought and it creates light. Not reach over and flip a light switch on. Not one that has a thought and light turns on. I'm talking about creates light. Like I know that all of us, we can get a clapper and it comes on, okay? I understand we can do that. But I want a God that when he has a thought, he speaks it, existence of it happens. Can you explain that? No. That's the size of the God that we need to be able to see. I want a God that I know can walk in the cool of the day with Adam. He can walk on this earth in the cool of the day with Adam, but at the same time, somehow he holds the earth in the palm of his hand. How does he do that? I just need to move to a place to know that that is the kind of God that I serve. That's the kind of God that is caught up in the things that are happening in my life, that are happening in my life. I don't want a God I can wrap my brain around. Because I know the limits of my brain. I know the things I face. I know the things, guys, that I faced this week. This week. And if my God is the size of my brain and my ability, I'll tell you, this week I would have been done. I would have been done. Game over. Game over. Because the battles that happened in my life this week... Guys, I'm not talking about last week. I'm talking about this week. The battle that happened in my life this week requires something far greater than my ability. My ability. That's what I want us to buy into before we even go any further. Is that we have a God that is far greater than any of our ability. And when we think we can't go any further, he says, guess what? I can. I can. Let's pray before we go any further. Heavenly Father, we love you. And God, we're... we're we're blown away. We really are. When we really even try to wrap our, 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 our mind around it, it's not possible. God, in the midst of all those things that you can do, that, that we even are aware of that you're capable of, 
every single prayer that is prayed, you hear. We don't understand that. But Lord, that not just my prayers and not just the prayers of my neighbors and not just the prayers of those in my town and those in this church, and, but those all around the world, you're capable. So God, we thank you and we love you. And Lord, I pray right now that our time together, our time together, Lord, it's not my words that touch our heart and lead us into how to live a life with you and well, how, we, how we handle spiritual warfare. But God, it's your words that penetrate our heart today. It's yours that lead us, that care for us. So God, we're not having to stand in line as though you're a motivational speaker and well, you can only hear from one of us at a time. God, you can hear from everyone in this room right now. And not only can you hear us, you can do something about it. And so, God, we just give it to you, give this time to you. And in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. So here's the thing. There is a battle, a war that is waging and going on right now over our life. I'll show it to you in Scripture. Jesus told us in, in John 10.10, 10, he said, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. Do you realize the battle of what that means that Jesus is showing you? So I'm going to hang out on this scripture for just a moment. We're going to hang out right here. Because, see, what is said right there, that is Satan's only purpose in our life. That is the only purpose he has for your life is to wage war against you. He is trying to steal everything that you've got. Or at least the one thing that will distract you from seeing him, from trusting him. If he can't get all of it, he's going to go after the one thing that will distract you from seeing and being close to him. He wants to steal everything you have. He's trying to kill you, as it says in that verse. And here's the thing we need to know. It's not a physical death. It's not a physical death that he's bringing. This is a spiritual death that he is bringing on people. I mean, here's, he is coming against our faith and trying to kill us because here's the thing. Just as Jesus has an eternal perspective and he says, I go and prepare a place for you, Satan has got an eternal perspective too. So I say, guess what? I got a place for you too. So he's trying to kill our walk. He's trying to kill us spiritually. I had a lady show up here at the church the other day. She comes in with her husband. As a matter of fact, she comes in before him, and she's like, we just need help. We're living in our car. And she said, I don't know what to do. And I could tell she was weighted. And I said, well, do you just need a minute to breathe? And she just started to cry. And I asked them about their faith and if they believed. And she said, you know, we do. She said, but my husband's faith is fading fast. The things we're up against and everything we're dealing with. She said, it's fading fast. She said, a matter of fact, she said, I woke up in our car last night, she said, to see him out on the road trying to get hit by a car. See, Satan had got in his life somehow, some way, in this spiritual battle and was attacking him and killing him spiritually that he himself was moving to a place to even act it out physically. Satan's got a plan to try and take you out. Don't think otherwise. Don't think otherwise. It also goes on to say that he is trying to destroy you. Crush your spirit. Crush it. If he can't kill you, he wants to burn your house down. He wants to burn it down and make life miserable. Because if he can crush your spirit, you can no longer be a testimony. Because people will look on at your life and say, I mean, you're a Christian. You have no happiness, which we we call and look at and say, no, we have joy. But when we let Satan get on the inside of it, here he is. He's crushing it. He's burning our house down. And all of a sudden it interrupts our testimony and what we can do in furthering the gospel. And he might not be sweating us because he's going, well, I know you're going to heaven, but I'm going to do everything that I can to stop you from taking anybody with you. That is his plans. That is his plans. That is who Satan is. If he can't kill you, then he wants to burn your house down. But here's the thing in that very same passage. We get something right after the word destroy. What do you see? A semicolon. Right? We get a semicolon. You know what a semicolon is? It lets us know the story isn't finished yet. Amen? It lets us know the story isn't finished yet. There's more to be said. I know people that have this as a tattoo. 
because they hit places in their life. They face something in their life, and it seemed as it could bring it to an end. But God showed up. God showed up, gave them life, and showed them a purpose, and their story continued. So after the semicolon, we get this, Jesus. Now, here's how I imagine this. This is, this is Jesus going, I. I was talking backstage with a team earlier, and we, somehow we started talking about Tony Robbins. You know, real big fella, right, motivational speaker. And we're talking about him, and I told him that I, I, I know for a fact from firsthand experience, backstage, Tony Robbins, when he gets ready to take a stage, he starts pounding his chest really hard, fired up. So, like, I have this vision of Jesus when he comes in that, that here we are. It says that the enemy comes to steal and to kill and destroy. All of a sudden we get a semicolon telling us that the story is not over yet. And we get Jesus go, I. That's the picture. We got Jesus going, I. He didn't say the enemy has come to steal and to kill and destroy. You should do something about it. You need to stand up. You need to figure it out. You can handle it on your own. But that's what we tend to do. We tend to face battles and things in our life that we go to a place, well, I can fix this. i, well, I, I got to do something. How do I get through this? And Jesus is showing in immense spiritual warfare. He goes, I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. That is our Jesus. Yeah, come on. We have, we have got a Jesus. He's not one that steals things from us, but gives us the desires of our heart according to his will for our life. He's not one that is set out to kill us, but one that gives us eternal life as a new creation in Christ. He is not one that destroys us, but one that equips us to tell of his good news through the power of our testimony. That is our Jesus. That is who is on our side. So when we get into a spiritual battle, we can look at it and say, well, I don't have to figure this out. As here I am, being attacked right now, and well, the enemy is doing everything he can to steal everything from me. Well, he's doing everything to kill my spirit, and he's doing everything that he can to destroy my spirit. We don't have to look at it and go, I'll figure it out. We get to look to Jesus and say, hey, Jesus, I heard you threw an eye in there, and well, I know you'll do something. We get to trust in him. Every attack has the same mission. How Satan goes about it, his strategies and tactics may be different, but the mission is the same. A spirit of fear attacks your, attacks your faith. Think about it. It starts instilling fear in you. He wants, to, he wants to take a strategy and put fear in you. All of a sudden, your, your faith gets challenged and it gets weak. So he's going to come at your faith through fear. Or how about this, a spirit of rejection. A spirit of rejection attacks your identity. So he's got these tactics, and there's so many more. He's got these tactics that he'll come against you to try to weaken you. He'll lie to you. He's very strategic. His army is highly organized. It really is. And he is orchestrating specific attacks, specific ones like he brought on my life this week, specific attacks against us believers. He wants to come against us with everything that he possibly has to derail us from our kingdom purpose, to stop us. Like I could see it this week, how he was doing all that he could to shut my purpose down. And if I would have stayed in the natural and tried to take it on myself instead of moving to this place of realizing that it, this is a spiritual war happening and God, I got to let you do it, then yes, he very much could have shut my purpose down. That is his goal, is to derail us. You ever seen a derailed train before? It's not like it just hops off and then hops back on, right? Like it's a mess. He wants to make your life a mess. Understand it. It's what he's doing. So how do we fight this battle? If that's what he's doing to us, how do we fight this battle? Brandon, I hear you say it. That that's what he wants to do and that Jesus wants to give us life and life to the full. How do I fight this? Here we go. I want you to know this. The points that I am giving today 
what I'm talking about today comes straight from the word, <laughs> as they should be every single week, okay? Like, as they should be. All right, so being that this is something that... Um, that is fault in the, spirit, the, the spiritual. Being that this is something fault in the spiritual, there's nothing truthfully that I can say in the natural that I can come up with that is, is, cr- is a crafty saying that um, can offer you an amazing tweetable quote, okay? Um, that, you know, just is, is something that I drum up that will defeat the enemy. I need you to hear that. There's nothing that Brandon can come up with that will defeat the enemy because this is done in the spiritual. This is done in the supernatural. Brandon is very much in the natural. Brandon is very much natural. So I have to rely on God. So at that, I needed to look at this and go, man, God, this is what he showed me. It has to be fully God, fully his word, with the authority of our Savior, his son, Jesus, and with the guidance and the support of the Holy Spirit. Am I able to point out the truth in this word to help us in our battle? He, I'm telling you, there is, there is so much that he has shown me this week. Like I'm talking about, so much content, so much, because God has so much to say about the Spirit, so much more than I, I promise you I'm able to bring you today. Like, I'll probably run a minute or two long. Okay, maybe maybe 10. But here's the thing. There's so much content that I have to bring today that I could not even fit it in this message. Even so that in the NIV, in the NIV, the Spirit is mentioned 625 times. That's how much God has to say about the Spirit. I didn't have 625 minutes even. So I've just taken, I said, God, show me what you want me to show them today. Show me and direct me in this. And, and I believe that this is what he is asking us to see. Where we're at, what we may be going through, and maybe this was just me even in this week. This is what God wanted us to be able to see. So on fighting this battle, we're going to look at putting on the full armor of God. That's what we're going to do today. We're going to look at putting on the full armor of God. So how do we fight this battle? Write this down. Put on the full armor of God. Full is your blank. Ephesians 6.11, Paul tells us, put on the full armor of God. I love this. That I, and I made this the word that stood out full. You know, you would think the armor of God would be what the blank you'd fill in. But there's something important about the fact he says full. Because this means not to put on some of it or put on partial armor. He says full. It's kind of like, when, whenever, ask a military guy. Ask a military guy now. This applied back then. You would ask them, hey, would you go into battle and not take your gun? Yeah, you don't need it. I'll just wave them to death, you know? No. You know, I'll just spit on them. That'll stop them. No. These guys know what they need. So they're going to take everything that they can in their arsenal and what it is that they're supposed to have fully equipped to go into the battle that they're headed into. That's why Paul's telling us, hey, church, as he's talking to them, don't just put on a few things. Don't just put on a partial equipment. Put on the full armor, meaning all. The NLT actually uses the word all. He goes on, he tells us to do this, so you can stand against the devil's schemes. So you can stand against the devil's schemes. Like I said earlier, he's got all kind of strategies. Right there is a verse to let us know. He's coming up with all kind of things to come against us. And Paul is telling us, you got to put it all on. All on. Every piece is important. He goes on to say in the very next verse, for we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies. In other words, natural ones we can see. That's not what we're fighting against. We may think we are, but we're not. But we are fighting against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against powers in the dark world, and against evil spirits in heavenly places. That's what we're fighting against. And again, I get it, I get it. This is hard to wrap our, our, our minds around. And that's why we, when we are being attacked in the spiritual, we retaliate in the natural. We have a tendency, because it's so hard to wrap our minds around and see that something is actually happening in a world we can't see, that we attack in the natural Meaning, people in our lives that it seems to be a problem with, instead of realizing that this is a supernatural war, that this is a spiritual war going on, we hurt the people in our lives. 
There's a fight going on between you and your spouse, and you think it has to do with her, or you think it has to do with him. It doesn't. It is what the enemy is doing to try and drag you apart. You have problems with your kids. Things are going wrong with them. And you think, what have I done wrong? How did I lead them this way? Did I not raise them right? The enemy is trying to convince you that something is at what you did, when really it is something that the Satan is doing in the supernatural, but we try to figure out a, a fix in the natural because we don't wrap our minds around it. We're having a hard time seeing this war that is going on above us. So we say things that hurt people. We say things that hurt people to try and make us feel a little bit better. We react in the natural because that's where we think it's coming from, but it's not. The attacks that I was, I, I was in this week, the ones I was in this week, there's no doubt it was because this message, message was already on the calendar that I was going to be speaking on spiritual warfare. One of the hardest attacks I've ever faced. Hardest I've ever walked through. Very easily could have appeared to come from the natural. Very easily. So easily. As a matter of fact, if you'd have been able to watch and you, you weren't looking at it from a spiritual place, you would have probably looked at it and agreed with how some of the responses were, were handled. You would have agreed that responding back in the natural would have been fully acceptable. No matter whose side you was on in this situation. You would have looked at it and said, you know what, responding in the natural, yeah, give it to him. Yeah, do that. Yeah, attack that way. It would have made sense. Completely made sense to attack in the natural. Because Satan did not want this message to be brought. He did not want this message to be brought. But what he didn't realize by attacking me this week, he was just helping me get prepared. That's what he did not wake up to and realize. Because what Satan means for harm, God will use for good. Amen? But we got to shift our thoughts. When we think it's in the natural and we're responding in the natural and we're even asking for help in the natural, God's going, hey, you do remember I have a son that stepped up and said, I, I have come. I have given you one that lets you live out the victory and take out the enemy that's trying to take that part of your life. These attacks are coming from evil rulers in the unseen world powers in the dark world and evil spirits in the heavenly realms but Paul says this he says to the church continuing on in verse 13 therefore put on every piece I love the fact he tells them again two verses later he tells them the same thing every piece like well Paul you just told me that I'm just making sure you know you need every single piece Every piece of God's armor. So you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then, remember last week, if you were here last week, I told you then is a promise word in the Bible. When you see the word then, get ready. Get your highlighter out because a promise is on the other side. Then, after the battle, you will be standing firm. You see, he didn't say war. Listen to me. Paul didn't say war. After the war, you will be standing firm because, see, you're saved by Christ. If you're in this room today and you believe Jesus Christ died for you to set you free from the sins on your life that he paid for you, he doesn't say war because the war has already been won. The war has already been won. See, we're fighting from a place of victory, not for a place of victory. The war has already been won, but Paul understood that we're going to go through some battles. On a daily basis, our marriage is going to come under attack. Our jobs are going to come under attack. Our finances are going to come under attack. But I love it when he says you put on the full armor of God, he says you'll stand firm. He doesn't say you'll stand queasy, wheezy, stumbling, unsafe, on, on, on breaking ground. He says you'll stand firm, firm. When we put on the full armor of God. So putting on the armor of God this week, when this message came together on Wednesday morning, real early, it just lined up. And I came to the office, and I just started writing, and point after point, I broke down and cried. 
And I had that song that we sang, the fourth song. I know I didn't have that in your worship guide because it was a last-minute ad, but Greater Things. I had that on just replay because on Wednesday, point after point, I was just broken and in tears because I physically felt like I was putting these pieces on. And the battle that I was in began to dissipate. And it wasn't with the ones that I was in it with. It was the one that was happening to me, the one that was in the supernatural. When that started to get itself in the right place, all of a sudden the natural started to clean itself up too. But it had to happen in the supernatural. And as I was putting this on, it's what I had to do to get through my battle. So let's talk about this, the armor of God. I'm going to do everything I can to move quick so you guys can eat lunch at 4 o'clock today, okay? All right. So the first thing Paul tells us to put on is the belt of truth. The belt of truth. That's in your blank. Stand your ground, he tells us, putting on the belt of truth. What does a belt do? It holds things up, right? That's what a belt does. It holds things up. I love that he tells us to put this on first. Think about it. Think about it. The belt of truth. Why I call it the belt of truth? Because it's the truth that will hold you up. When you're at a place that lies are coming on you and coming against you, it is the truth that you know that a lot of times is a testimony that we can look back. God brought me through that. God took care of me in that. God delivered me from this. It is that truth that will hold us up so we can stand firm. And when the enemy tells you lies to tear you down, you will continue to stand firm. What is the truth? Here's just a few things. You probably have ones you can fill in yourself. But here's some truth. That you are bought by the most high. I'm talking about there's nobody higher than him. He purchased you through his son. Jesus has paid it all for you. Heaven is yours. That you have a redeemer who loves you unconditionally. He doesn't look at what you did last night. He ain't sweating it. He's not. He's not going, oh, you said that this morning while getting your kids ready? My love meter ticked down a little bit for you. It just kind of ticked on down a little bit. No. He loves you. That's truth to go, I may fail in the natural, but my God loves me unconditionally. Unconditionally. That's a truth. Here's a truth. That victory is yours Because you're his. That's a truth we get to hold on to. Those are truths. Belt of truth holds us up. He says also let's cover ourselves with a breastplate of righteousness. Verse 14, the second part, he says, with a breastplate of righteousness in place. He's telling us, put it on. Why breastplate? Why would we put that right there? Because in battle... You face forward. Have you ever seen a movie where in the battle they're fighting like this? (laughs) No, right? We put the breastplate on right here. Because this is a prominent place of attack. Because the truth is, you can actually lose brain function and your body still be alive because your heart is pumping. But if he can take out your heart, he will shut you down. So all of a sudden, if he can take out your heart and tell you that your heart is a problem... He starts to remove you from that you are in right standing with God. He wants to do that to you. He wants to take your heart. But because we put on the breastplate of righteousness, he comes against your heart. You can say anything you say against me, come against me, do against me, anything. I need you to understand, Satan, that I am in right standing with God. The breastplate is almost like a slap in the face to him. Because as he's trying to remove you from being in right standing, he can't do it. You have been put in right standing when you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You put on the righteousness on your chest. Say, I am in right standing and nothing you can say or do will ever take away my eternity in heaven. He's like, "Mm, all right. So now I've got to come up with another scheme to come against you. What am I going to do? Well, he's got the belt of truth. And he's got this breastplate of righteousness. You know, here's what I'll do. I'll attack his feet. So Paul says this. Put on the shoes of the good news. The shoes of the good news. Verse 15. For shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news. I love that. So that you will be fully prepared. Why shoes? Why shoes? 
It's what we walk in. It's whenever we're going, it's what goes first. Like, it is the first thing. I don't care if you walk backwards. Your shoes still go first. Wherever you go, your feet go first. So he's saying, strap on the good news. Tell people about me. Share my good news that you are saved. Share the good news that I have set you free. Share the good news that you are loved and nothing can ever separate you from my love. Strap on the good news as you proceed. Nothing will stop you. Strap on the good news. And ladies, you know what I'm talking about. I understand sometimes fashion over comfort, right? Like, I get it. But the good news brings comfort to us. It brings a comfort to us that says, you know what? I am bought. I am purchased. I have eternity in heaven. My God loves me. What can be against me? Because he is for me. It is the good news that brings us comfort. And whatever we're comfortable in is what we go in. So we got that in us. We strap our feet. So this is one of those places you put comfort over fashion, people. We got to have the word strapped and spread the news as we go, which is part of the reason Satan tries to really attack our feet. He wants us to stumble so bad. Next week, we're going to talk about the third thing you ask most. How do I share my faith? How do I tell people about Jesus? How do I do that? Because there is something about it that we all want to do but we refrain from it for some reason. We just don't. We just don't do it. He says, strap our feet. Put on the shoes of the good news. So what do we got on so far? We got our belt of truth, right? We got our breastplate of righteousness on. What else have we got on? We now have our shoes of the good news. From there, let's take up the shield of faith. He goes on to say in verse 16, In addition to all of these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. What does a shield do? It deflects things. A shield designed in this day and time was not just a a front flat piece. Like it would have had a, a curvature to it of some kind, whether it was a sharp point or it was rounded. So that way you didn't even feel it as it was hitting you. It would deflect it off. You get what I'm saying? So he's saying pick up the shield of faith. Because so often our faith will start to be something that, well, I don't know that I believe. I mean, yeah, am I saved? Yeah, yeah, I'm saved. And Well, I mean, I, I do want to tell people about him. And, and I mean, yeah, I, I know there's truth to the fact that I, I just, God, where are you at? Where are you at? And all of a sudden we're exposed. He's telling us to hold up that shield. Because the lies of the enemy are going to try and come against us. And we don't need to allow it to get to our heart or get to our mind. Even though we've got protection over our heart. In a moment, we'll talk about the protection over our mind. Even though we have that, Paul is telling us, let's not let it get near. Don't hold your shield here. Don't go, I just don't know. He says, hold it up. If you ever watch a battle, I don't care which scene, and you see somebody using a shield, they're up with it. They're blocking those things off because they're like, I'm not letting you get to my vital parts. I'm not going to let you take it out. And so that's where we stand in faith and say, God, I believe in you. I believe in who you are. Nothing thrown at me will hit me. We pick up our shield of faith. I love the fact that it's a shield and it just deflects it off. To flex it off. And here's the thing. We think we, that these arrows that he's shooting at us because we're Christians, well, they won't hurt us. Oh, well, we're with God, so, so these arrows can't hurt us. I need you to know something. The fall of man came from an arrow from Satan. His scheme. When Eve and Adam sinned, It was because of the fact that they had set down their faith in God for a moment. Did it take away their eternity? Is it going to take away your eternity? No. But when all of a sudden it's attacking your faith and coming against you, these arrows have strength when we don't have our armor. But when we've got our armor, these things are like Nerf bullets. (laughs) You get you with me? Get that shield of faith and lift it up. Let's turn these arrows into Nerf bullets, right? Let's turn them into Nerf bullets. I'm talking about the soft ones, the ones that really don't hurt at all, right? But when that thing is down, they can hurt. They can be a big deal. 
If it wasn't a big deal, God wouldn't have put it in his word. God wouldn't have told Paul to tell us to lift up a shield of faith to deflect those things away from us if these arrows were not a big deal. They are a big deal. But he gives us this tool to fend them off. The next thing he tells us to do is to put on the helmet of salvation. Put on the helmet of salvation. He tells us in verse 17, the first part of it, put on, a sal- put on salvation as your helmet. Our mind tends to play tricks on us, and Satan wants to talk to it and confuse it. If there was anything that we ever needed to know, like we need to know, it is that we are saved. If you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have said those words and said, Jesus, I accept you as my Lord and Savior. If you've done that, he wants to confuse you and trick you. But Paul tells us, put on salvation as your helmet. And by doing this, we are protecting our mind from Satan's schemes that tell us that we are not worthy. That goes on to tell us that we should be ashamed of the way that we live. That we don't deserve salvation. That's why he wants to play tricks in our mind and mess with us in, making us think those things. That is not what God has ever said to us. Those are lies from Satan. But when we put on salvation as our helmet, we can protect ourselves from those lies and know for a fact that we are saved, that God freely gives the gift of salvation. So let's protect our mind by putting it on. Now Paul gives the final piece of armor right here. And it's the sword of the Spirit. The second part of verse 17 says, And take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Here's what's interesting about the sword of the Spirit. It is the only weapon of offense listed. Everything else that he tells us is actually defense. It's the only thing that is for the offense. Meaning the only way that we go at Satan is not with the ability of my righteousness, not even with the ability of my truth that I hold on to, not even with the fact that I am saved. I don't go at him. Those things protect me. What I go at him with, what I go against him with, is the same thing that Jesus used, and that is the word of God. The sword of the Spirit is the word of God of God. Jesus did this. When attacked by Satan, when Satan came on, his response back, he didn't even look at it. He showed us such a pure example. Such a pure example. He didn't look at Satan and said, and he didn't go, I said you cannot eat. (laughs) You cannot live on bread alone. He didn't he didn't even he goes, it is written. He even looked to his father to show us how to do it. To say, my God, it is written. You see, that's picking up that sword. That's picking up that sword and being able to will it whenever he's coming at you. Yeah, you've got your protective elements. You've got your protective elements, but there are times that we have to be able to attack. And what do we use? We use the word of God. How well do you know it? How involved is it in your life? It's said about samurais. I love love samurais and it if you're alive, everybody thinks samurais are cool. If you don't, I don't know, go watch a movie about them or something. I don't know. It's said about samurais that when you when they were born and they were to follow in that lineage of being a samurai, you know, that was the path that they were on. The sword was brought into the birth room. Their sword that they would grow up with was brought into their birth room and laid in the bed right next to them because there was going to be an intimate relationship with their word, with their sword, right? Like us, we need an intimate relationship with our word. So here they are with the sword. All throughout their life, they're learning what it means, how it feels, how to use it. And when they pass on, when they die, it's actually laid beside them in their bed again. Meaning that their sword is so important in their life, it is with them from the moment they're born to the moment they pass and everything in between. That's how we should be with our sword. Hebrews tells us that the word of God is sharper than any double-edged sword. A samurai sword is on one side, meaning I could take that brother out if I needed to, right? Because I got two sides to my sword. But it's even sharper 
as it's come, Satan is coming against us. We've got it. He goes before me preparing a way. You will not take my future. Oh, he's not anywhere near you. As I draw near him, he will draw near to me. Oh, you're going to have to work for it. He freely gives. Do you know the word? Because when he presents himself, you've got all these things to protect you. But through the word of God, we will push him back and take him out. Using words, it is written. Because God's word is truth. And that is why it is so powerful. So pick it up. Get to know it. Know what it means. Discover how it feels. And learn to use it. I added this this morning. There's one thing that Paul says at the end of this very part right here. And there's a whole series coming just on this. Because we're going to go into our 21 days of prayer, August the 5th. And I really am convinced that there's a lot of us that don't know how to pray. We don't know what it means. We don't know what it looks like. We're, we're really confused. We're uncertain. We don't know the power behind it. Paul goes on to tell them in the very next verse, he says, and pray in the Spirit at all times. Meaning as we battle, that we're deflecting, we're defending, even when we're attacking with the Word of God, we're talking to Him. We're communing with Him, and we're confronting Satan. That's what our prayers are doing. And so for the weeks preceding the 21 days, starting August 5th, we're going to do a series on prayer. And my heart is to open our minds up. I pray God opens our minds up to understanding the power of prayer and how important it is in our life. And we can do just this very thing that Paul's calling us to do. It's that we live out this life, that every single chance that we always are moving in this place, that there we are without reluctance, that we are praying in the Spirit at all times. So my heart is that we we move to that place. And so I want you to, between now and then, be looking forward to it because God's going to do something miraculous in that series to help us move to that place of communing with God and confronting Satan in a powerful, powerful way. You guys wanted to know about spiritual warfare and what to do. I, I pray that today God's word has spoken to you in some way and that whatever you're facing, whatever you're going through, you can move to writing down this last statement. You'll move to this place because you've put on the armor of God. You're able to say this with, with no worries. You probably can fill it in on your own. I'm not fighting for a place of victory. I'm fighting from a place of victory. I'm not fighting for a place of victory. I am fighting from a place of victory. Like the song we sang earlier, that Greater Things, it's by Mac Brock. He says in there, I will not fear, for you are with me. I've seen this fight from the victory. No power in hell could stand against me, because I've seen this fight from the victory. We put on the armor of God. There is no problem being able to stand and know that we are fighting from a place of victory. Because we can look and say, God, you never fail. You never fail. You never fail. Thank you.